Okay, so I'm using another laptop at the moment, so I hope the quality is a bit better. Um, I guess we'll see. Um, I want to try to get into Ampere's law and how we can get that. So I'm going to once again start with a version of the Maxwell's equations. Um, just notice here I'm completely ignoring any constants. So there's supposed to be a magnetic constant, for example, here. And we're also assuming that the electric field doesn't change with time, otherwise we get a very uncomfortable term here. <coughs> so um, if we assume those things, then we get this form, which is just that the curl of the, of the magnetic field, and we spoke about curl before, it's basically just how much it would curl, and then a perpendicular vector. So if you have a piece of like a stick in the water, that's the vector field. If it starts curling, then you have a curl in that direction. Um, if it doesn't start curling, you have zero curl. Um, so it's that same intuition. So the curl of the um, <coughs> in your magnetic field be equal to your current density vector. So if you have current going in this way, you're going to have a curl of the magnetic field around that. And we saw that in the lectures. That's the result we got. And um, that's just the right-hand rule. Um, and that's how the curl works as well. So just a reminder that our current density is just current divided by the area that it go it's going through. So if we're going to think about trying to get um, all the current that goes through a certain surface, so I just identify the surface here, and then we have a, a little bit of current through this, so this is a wire, um, and there's a total current I. So the current um, density um, in this portion is just the current divided by the area in this portion, the current density in the rest is going to be zero. Um, and then we can also think about um, basically just trying to sum over all of this to get the current density at each point um, times its area, sum over everything, then everything's going to be zero except at this stage, and it's going to give us the area times the current den density, which is just the current. So if we sum over the entire area of the surface, we should be able to get the total current that's going through this surface. Um, and that's what Ampere's law tries to give us. So we're going to have a double integral, um, which is very uncomfortable, and we're going to try to get rid of that. Um, over this entire thing, I'm not going to write it explicitly, but just through an arbitrary surface of the current density dot with the area element, so it's just the way out. Um, since we only want the current that's going through the, um, through the surface, if it's going, um, like parallel to the surface, the current's not really going through, we're not going to be able to calculate that and we're not interested in that. So that's why it's dot product, so only that's going through this and then with the area. So we can think this isn't perfect notation, so don't t take it as such, but just to give you the idea, since um, J times A is going to give you I, it's the same as taking the current at each point and dotting it with the normal vector. So it's just taking the current that's normal to our surface. Um, and this is a bit better way of writing it, just replacing this J with the cross product of B. And now we can start to wonder what part of this, uh, the, the curl of B, and what part of this is going to be preserved by this dot product. So the dot product is going to only basically give us the numerical value of the vector in the direction of, the, of this um, area element. So that's precisely normal to this um, surface. So what part of a curl, um, which part of this is the vector that's pointing straight out of the surface? Well, we can think about the cross product um, to use that intuition. If I had the cross product between two vectors, the result of the cross product, say I have A cross B equals C, then C's X component is going to be um, proportional to A and B's Y and Z components, but not their X components. And similarly for each coordinate, it's going to be um, proportional to the other two coordinates and not itself. So the part of um, this that's going to go out, that's normal to it, that's going to be proportional to everything that's not normal to it, that's parallel to the surface. So the part of the magnetic field that lies in the surface is the only part that's going to be preserved by this dot product. So we're only going to deal with the magnetic field that's in the surface. So when I'm going to try to simplify this to a single integral, we can very safely only deal with the vectors inside that, that lie parallel to the surface. We can just imagine that the rest doesn't exist because it basically gets destroyed in the math by this dot product right here. So now that um, we've basically reduced the problem from a 2D surface in some 3D space to just considering 
some 2D surface. Um, I'm going to start by defining the surface. We're just going to start with a rectangle. Um, in, in practice, this, the surface can be anything, but um, for the arguments I'm going to be making, it's just easier to see what's going on if it's a rectangle. Also, I'm going to define a direction of this um, perimeter, which is just according to the right-hand rule. Um, that's just convention, basically, um, to just deal with everything later on. So now we're going to start with some vector field inside this, which very clearly has zero curl. So whatever simplification we're going to have to make, it has to take into account that this vector field has zero curl. Um, so we can notice something interesting, first of all. Um, it's very closely related to um, what we did about a, a conservative force, um, which not only is a... Um, which you'll recognize because I also explained how a conservative force, how its vector field can't have a curl. Um, so then if we take this field, for example, this has zero curl. Um, so it should be a conservative force if we consider this vector field as a force field, um, which for the magnetic field it is, um, kind of. Um, not completely since we have the weird interaction with velocity of force, but... Um, so if we consider this field, if we take this path, this closed path in this field, if it's a conservative force, then the work done through this loop has to be zero. But let's make it more general. So it's for any vector field, not just something to do with force. So instead of saying work, we say we take this path and everywhere along this path, we take the dot product with the vector at that point, And we say that for that, this is zero because this is a conservative force. And we wanted some function of this field that gives us zero since we have zero curl. Now, if we change, say we change one vector here, we want to, we, we want to say, well, we want to cheat this system. We want to show it doesn't work, doesn't represent it, because we can keep everything on the edge the same and then just change the direction of this vector. Now you might say, well, look, this, if you take the work here, it's still zero. But if you look at the curl, the total curl of this enclosed region right here, we can see that here, it'll give us a negative curl since it's in that direction. And here, it'll give us a positive curl because it's in that direction. If you just imagine a little stick drifting here on this water, whatever. So the positive and the negative, they're exactly going to cancel out. So the, the, so the total curl in this area is still zero. This is a force. This is why we have to go away from this intuition. This would still not be conservative for this small region. Um, but um, that, that, that's something else. So if we just look at this, now we see that the total curl is still zero and our dot product of the vector with this loop is also going to be zero. Now, we want this dot product to go away from zero. Um, so we also want, and we also want the total curl to not be zero and see if they correspond. So if we change these two vectors as well, because if I only do this, it's the same thing. Positive curl in this direction, negative curl in that direction, they cancel out to zero. But if I use the advantage here, that there's an edge here, so that if I go all the way to this edge, even the vector on that edge is now in a different direction, I've got this positive curl here. But in this direction, I don't have the negative curl to cancel it out. It will be outside of my surface. So now, the total curl here is no longer zero. So now let's see if the contribution from this path, if we take the dot product along this path with every vector at each point, if that's also still going to be, if that's going to stay zero, or if it will change with our curl. So if we see here, they say this uh, during this part, we have three vectors together with it, so that's going to give us some contribution, some positive contribution. This is going to be zero, and this is going to be zero because it's perpendicular the vector field to this. That's why I wanted the rectangle to get that nice cancellation. And this is going to cancel out this part, is anti-parallel to this. So this is going to cancel out with this one, and this vector right here is going to cancel out with this one. Since it's parallel here, it's going to have a positive contribution, and here it's negative, so it'll have an equal negative contribution. So these two will cancel out. But yeah, this is in the same direction, so this is a positive con contribution. But this vector is also now in the same direction here. So that will also have a positive um, contribution. So these two will no longer cancel out. So the total 
of this through this loop will no longer be zero. Um, at the same time, the total curl inside this loop is also no longer zero. So we see that the only way to get a non-zero curl from some vector field is to propagate it all the way to the edge, or else you'll, you'll just have it cancel out in the center again. And so if we just look at the way this edge cancels out and what doesn't, we can already um, deduce what the curl is from this inside. And this is called Stokes' theorem um, in the general case. Um, and I'll go through how that so, um, how that basically applies to Ampere's law. So now formalizing it a bit more mathematically. So we had this expression that we determined that will give us something proportional to our total um, total current through our surface that's covered by this double integral. And we showed that this can be simplified to this part right here, which is just basically all around that surface. We're going to take a top dot product with that surface with a little line element which is also a vector in that case. Um, and we're just going to take the dot product with that all around that, and that's going to give us the same value as this. Um, we didn't show it rigorously, but just gave the idea. And then if we introduce our mu naught constant or electric constant back, then we get this result, which we already know. Um, so this just basically shows how you go from one of Maxwell's differential um, formulations, um, which is that this is basically proportional to your current density, um, and show that if we have this integral around a surface, we can get all the current that's enclosed by that surface um, that we only have to know the, the magnetic field at the edge of. Um, and yeah, that's Ampere's law.